Hi. Um, Hi. Welcome, Esteban Ramon Perez. Um, I'm happy that you were able to join us today to chat about this current year and all of its many, many um, iterations of uh, dramas and trials. Um, I thought we could just start right away with just an open-ended question. Um, just tell us what's foremost on your mind right now. Um, foremost on my mind is uh, this current situation uh, existing during in the United States during the pandemic, during uh, political turmoil uh, far away from my family. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us, um, tell us what, you, what are you missing? What does it mean to be far away from your family? Who's, who's there? So I'm from, I was born in, uh, in LA, uh, Los Angeles, California. And I grew up just outside of uh, LA in the greater Los Angeles area. Um, my family, friends, they're all based out of Southern California. Mm -hmm. And I am currently in New Haven at um, New Haven, Connecticut and Next Haven, uh, an art project uh, uh, founded by Titus Kafar. Mm -hmm. um, I had just graduated 2019 from uh, Yale painting and printmaking. And so I uh, became a studio fellow immediately after. And so this is my third year in New Haven. Oh, wow. So, who, so what does it mean to be away from your family? I know that seems like a question that, I'm, uh, that anyone should know, but it's different for everyone, no? Um, yeah. Especially right now. So uh, not to get to detailed, but um, while I was at Yale, before the pandemic happened, um, my mother suffered from a stroke. And so I had to deal, that from, uh, deal with that from long distance. Uh, but before I was able to visit, uh, and then with, when the pandemic hit, it kind of, uh, you know, pushed the brakes on everything. So last time I was able to see my mother physically was in February. Um, and, uh, you know, family or home is where family is, you know, home, home is where the heart is. So that's kind of, that's where my heart is. My wife and I uh, both live here in New Haven. Uh, and we uh, have been keeping each other company. And, um, but we both terribly miss uh, our home and, uh, you know, uh, the people who are there. Hmm. Yeah. Have you found that has sort of made its way into the work that you're doing? Or have you been able to work during all of this? Yeah, um, you know, fortunately, as stressful uh, as it has been to kind of just, you know, live during this time, um, I've been, you know, fortunate enough to have a studio space here at Next Haven and access to the space. Um, I live just next door, so my whole world is just next building and this building right now. And uh, so, yeah, the past six months, I've just been really pushing myself to stay focused in my work. It's been a really good distraction um, for the most part and uh, has been, a, well, has helped uh, passing time. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ideas that have informed your work? I guess maybe we can have a, a, a start point at January, right? Um, and how have they evolved in conversation with all of this or have they? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, what I've noticed is that my work has always been about um, social politics to some extent. Uh, I'm the son of, a, of immigrants. I am a first generation Chicano and my parents are both from Mexico. And so I've been, um, I guess, politically active in the sense that I've been, uh, or Politi politically aware for, for a while now, since I was a teenager. And, um, you know, when I was a teen, I participated in walkouts, uh, protesting um, anti-immigration uh, laws. And, and so I've kind of been um, interested in, in US politics in a while. And so my work has always had a little uh, branch in that. And so when, you know, things started happening with the pandemic, um, including all the protests, uh, what I what I was surprised to see was that a lot of some of my work that I was already working on just became that much more relevant. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about about that about the work that became a little bit more relevant in what way? Sure, sure. So in 
2019, um, around, I think almost a year ago now, so like August, um, I had came across two articles um, regarding uh, prison firefighters. Um, and that really moved me to, to make a piece. Um, so the situation was that um, I had learned that the majority of prison firefighters, or I'm sorry, the majority of uh, our, our California's reliance on prison labor um, was uh, due to uh, these prison programs where they would train prisoners into, uh, into firefighters and then they would pay them um, about a dollar an hour uh, to put out these fires and uh, you know um, there's there's a multitude of issues with that alone but the fact that uh, people um, are dying um, because of these fires um, to to pretty much either save private property or uh, to just uh, con you know uh, because our uh, uh, California's uh, firefighters are kind of underfunded in, in many ways um, is an issue on its own. <clears throat> but um, that it really moved me to make a piece about fire. And so with that being the kind of um, fuel behind it, so then I, it led to a lot of research uh, around my understanding of fire. And since I grew up in SoCal, I kind of grew up around fires. Uh, it's very normal for me. You know, I, I have very post-apocalyptic memories of you know, be, being uh, surrounded by hills on fires. And, you know, and so it's kind of normal to me, but at the same time, um, you know, with climate change and everything, and with um, the pandemic uh, hitting the way it hit, um, you know, now there's over a dozen, over two dozen fires in, in California currently that are out of control because uh, prison, prisoner firefighters are not available um because of COVID and um that I think that just highlights our our reliance to that prison labor um our reliance to what is potentially slave labor um and you know the the kind of uh, backward ethics that we kind of um um you know it's making me think of like a lot of other um connections from like um High school, high school to prison systems, and so on and so forth. But, anyways, that kind of all went into uh, a piece that I started in August. Um, and so, um, just to backtrack a little bit, once the pandemic hit, and once I, you know, uh, I had all this research around this piece, and then it just, uh, I started seeing it unfold again as soon as the uh, the fire season came along. Um, another thing that I was going to, kind of, that was kind of going into the piece was. Um, um, imagery of, of of cop cars cop cars on fire, and so now we can. I, I was having a hard time at first to to find a couple of images. Uh, there was protests from 2018, um, um, and from uh, even Ferguson that I was able to find some of these cop cars on fire. But then now you know you search on the internet and they're everywhere um, because of everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a, a connection to. Um this idea of prison labor one dollar a day and the narratives about essential workers that sort of rose out of you know from march as being essential sort of being heroes at the same time right there's all these ignoring sort of their conversations about protesting the fact that they didn't have agency to do what they right. did there's some idea about like um essential did that stand out to you as well this idea of yeah totally know? um i <laughs> had made a piece um let me see it was also last summer and so I brought it up again recently, and uh, it's a contorted leather sculpture. Uh, but but what I had did was I attached um, leather, uh, you know, gardener gloves to to both sides of it, giving it kind of like a humanoid uh, presence. Uh, and so once once I pulled it out, and you know, in the context of everything that's going going on with essential workers, that's what I ended up titling titling the piece. Uh, uh, because um, it so happens that the majority of essential workers are uh, by PLC, and um, you know it's it's a uh, it's a familiar story. And you know what one thing that really um, made my blood boil was you know the conditions uh, which undocumented workers have always been 
working under, but you know, especially during the pandemic and during the fire season ha has been, you know, um, really, um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how to explain express it it's just, it's it's uh totally beyond my imagination of how we would really treat people mm -hmm. yeah there's there's a way in which um and on on one hand there's a a, a more mainstream narrative about uncertainty being a now thing right something connected to this moment where that seems to be an ongoing part of a lot of people's lives all year round right like this idea of uncertainty um and agency as well I'm um, so I'm hearing that sort of thread in your work. This idea you, you mentioned, you know, this idea of essentially, you know, slave labor in terms of who has to put their lives at risk and what people are risking. Um, and I, I I know that there's uh, there seems to be um, a core of that in your work as well, a sort of attention to who uh, who is at risk, right? And whose whose narrative is do we hear? And when do we get to hear it, right? And who frames that narrative? Have I gotten that right? Is that sound yeah, that's definitely an aspect, um, and it's you know that that stems from my parents being immigrants. Um, I I got to see uh, how people treat them, um, and that has also affected me um, immediately. Uh, I've been in so uh, just to give a little bit of that story. Um, um, I grew up in my dad's upholstery shop, so uh, when I was around five years old, he started working out of our two-car garage. Uh, and he started his own upholstery business. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up, you know, helping him out since, at a very young age. And so when he um, finally, uh, when I finally graduated high school, I should say, he finally bought his own um, shop, uh, professional shop. So then I started working for him full time immediately after high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, up, up, up and through uh, undergrad um, when I went to CalArts. But um, I, you know, since I've been helping him for a very long time, I remember uh, multi <laughs> so many situations where people would uh, just treat him so unfairly um, in front of me. Um, and um, that really, you know, brought a quick awareness of like how, how my parents are seen, how I'm seen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has definitely affected the work, uh, mainly because um, I try to work from a subjective place and not just about my subjectivity but just for a, about my experience as a person um and you know uh because i am you know politically aware in some ways that's another reason why it shows up in the work mm -hmm. um would you mind talking about the collaboration is that the right word that you did with your dad with your leather works the works with skin yeah uh that yeah so so um, when I was at Yale, I went there to paint, which is why I ended up in the painting program. Uh, and so um, I used to make paintings, you know, like acrylic on canvas or oil on canvas. And so when I got there, I was surrounded by 40 something other paintings. Um, I mean, painters, I should say. And it really, I was really put off by the painting conversation. Um, I just, it was painting church and I realized that I wasn't really um, a believer in that sense. So I decided to put paint medium away for a little bit and uh, I challenged myself to make paintings um, out of an alternative material. And so I had found um, myself trying to utilize uh, upholstery scraps, um, including uh, leather scraps, but also um, fabric remnants that came from my, my dad's upholstery shop. So. I had asked uh, my dad uh, to send me a kind of uh, a box full of uh, random uh, scraps. And so he sent me uh, fabrics and leather. And one of the first pieces I made was a leather scrap piece. And what I really tried to do was uh, be true to his hand in the sense that he had cut these fabrics uh, for other work. And I didn't want to uh, I, I tried not to cut the, the material as best as I could in order to kind of um, uh, respect his his cut, I guess. Mm -hmm. So so it ended up being a collaboration in the sense that he made the cuts and I put the um, the composition together, which which made the you know what I call um, um, you know leather paintings, fabric paintings, um, sculpture paintings. Mm -hmm. 
Why was it significant not to touch the cuts? Um, it was it was almost like a thank you. It was my way of thanking my dad. Um, you know, I still get a lot of materials from my father's shop, but I also source them from other just upholstery suppliers now. Um, there's a local upholstery shop that I started. Uh, I uh, made a relationship with a, a upholsterer here, and he's been supplying me as well. So uh, I cut into all the materials now. Uh, but those first few pieces was just uh, my way of thinking, thanking him, um, because I, I had felt like I had found my way in, in, in many respects. Um, and um, yeah, that was, that was just, uh, you know, a homage. Mm. Um, this may seem, let's see how this question goes, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what would be the most dangerous thing we could forget about this moment? I suppose that's where my qu what question is. And, and well, maybe, maybe the other side of that question is, what's the most important thing we should remember right now? Who, what, why, the, you know, the meanings, the moments. But I'm, I'm somehow for you, I'm, I'm, I want to know what's the most dangerous thing we, and we being this or that, um, could forget about now, you know? Um, things are happening so quickly. Um, things are changing and evolving every minute. Um, uh, yeah, what matters most? What should be at the center? I think what is one of the most dangerous things that we can forget as as a people right now is probably the um, the delicacy of of our situation. Um, you know, speaking in a global way, um, we're. We're, we're dealing with the pandemic right now, but uh, at our doorstep is uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of been one of my stress stresses uh, in many ways. Um, I, you know, I know a handful of people who, who honestly don't, um, not necessarily that they don't believe, but they don't really consider it, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of people think that climate change is attached to politics. Mm -hmm. And so they find themselves kind of uh, not wanting to talk about, you know, or, or being put off by pol politics. So I think uh, one of the most dangerous things uh, right, that we can forget right now is, is, um, is uh, what, what comes next after the pandemic once, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have I have a lot of answers to that to that question, but um, you know, it, it just another thing is just um, I'm really troubled by it as well um, how you know probably the worst of the worst has been highlighted this year. I think I think so many uh, truths have been uh, brought to the foreground, uh, and that we're staring them in the face, and people are very. Um, um, numb to it you know um the way we treat people the way we treat undocumented workers um prisoners um you know black and brown bodies and and you know i think what has been really disturbing for me is but is a culture that is very accept accepting of this treatment you know um and that's i think that's another you know big red flag for me mm. Yeah, it's it's it seems almost that it it's a necessary part of the way that we organize our lives, right? The suffering in a way. We have, I'm hearing that in how, when I say necessary, I don't mean justified, but it just seems that it's designed to run so that you know prison labor puts out the fires, <laughs> so essential labor does that work, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean that's a that has a, I mean has that struck you as well or no? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, that's that that was that aha moment when when uh, as I mentioned before, when I was making the fire piece, um, I had already thought that that was unjustifiable. But then, um, you know, the, now these fires are uncontrollable, and and it's due to um, a lack of resources because we don't have any prisoners. I I I it made, it made me laugh in a very, um, you know. Uh, in a way that made my stomach turn at the same time, um, just because uh, it's very ironic. You know, California is supposed to be one of the most progressive states in the United States, and in many ways, it's so backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
we're at that point. Um, is there anything I didn't think to ask you or any last thing you definitely want to get on here that um, this is your moment? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to just give a shout out. I'm, I'm, okay. a, shout out. I'm a little old school, you know. Uh, it's like I'm on the radio. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, shout out to my wife, Grace Andrea Perez. Uh, she's been a foundation, um, a, a, like um, a, a solid foundation for me uh, because I would honestly go crazy without her, um, especially during this time. Um, shout out to my family, my mother, my dad, uh, my sisters, and uh, my brother-in-law, and uh, all my friends from back home. Um, on the West and East Coast, I should say, uh, because I have a lot of I have a lot of beautiful friends here now as well. So, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Nessa. Okay.